Ping Zhao from um, Zhao Tong University in Shanghai, China, and the Rutgers University in the U.S. So he's going to tell us about, um, about the community ecology of the human gut microbiota in disease and health. Okay. Thank you, Professor Shou. And also, I would like to thank the organizing committee to give me the opportunity to come to join this uh, very interesting conference. This is my uh, second uh, uh, computational biology conference. The first one was in China, 2004, in Kunming, and uh, most of speakers were uh, Chinese or overseas Chinese professors. And, uh, but at that time, uh, Terry Hua was there. At that time, I was the only speaker talking about uh, bacterial community. But now we have a whole meeting devoted to microbial community. So this is really wonderful. Um, so I changed my uh, title from uh, multi-omics approach, dissecting the microbial community function, to this uh, understanding community ecology uh, in, you know, uh, of gut microbiota, just because I have been inspired by so many talks uh, talking about uh, the gut community. So I would like to share my thoughts with you. Uh, I also would like to thank my team, particularly in Shanghai, and also my collaborators and uh, funding agencies. And uh, I have been uh, blessed with uh, a wonderful team uh, in Shanghai. And uh, we know uh, now uh, gut microbiota can contribute to our phenotypes in disease or health just because when they grow in our gut, they produce various bioactive compounds which can get into our bloodstream, circulate, and regulate our genes, impact our immunity, and modulate our metabolism. And uh, uh, more than 100 years ago, Professor Metinikov already proposed that Toxic compounds produced by gut microbiota may be driving aging and aging-related diseases. Chinese medicine also believes that fecal toxicity is driving all kinds of diseases. Now we know uh, neurotoxins, carcinogens, and uh, immunotoxins, so all kinds of toxins have been identified and studied in, in various uh, uh, systems and have been shown that they can get into our bloodstream either through the enterohepatic circulation or more often through partially impaired gut barrier. But from a microbial ecological uh, perspective, we know gut microbiota is just a microbial ecosystem. And the most important question as a microbial ecologist, uh, I would like to answer is who does what in the microbiome? And uh, if you look at, uh, uh, if you borrow concepts from macroecosystem ecology, we know that ecosystems are providing benefits to human society. So each benefit can be considered as an ecosystem service. And uh, so gut microbiota must also provide all kinds of ecosystem service to benefit human host. And uh, many of such uh, benefits can only be provided by gut bacteria, such as production of short-chain fatty acids, which we do not encode in our own genome. And we must rely on our gut bacteria for that kind of function. And we know from macroecology, species are not equally important. Like in a, a closed forest, tall trees are the so-called foundation species. They are the species, when they grow to a certain abundance level, they close the system, they create a very unique inside environment, which is uh, you know, structuring the whole, gut, whole uh, ecosystem. So we would like to know whether in a healthy gut microbiota uh, can we identify such foundation species. And we also know that uh, in macroecosystems, species are not uh, independent from each other. Different species form different uh, functional groups, which can be called guild. And the members of each guild, they increase or decrease together. They thrive or decline together. So we would like also to know if in a gut microbial ecosystem, different bacterial populations or species, they form different functional groups or different guilds. So these are the uh, ecological questions that we would like to ask. But if you look at the human gut, it's just a walking bioreactor. It's a chemostat. 
and uh, the nutrients we constantly putting into the system are from two sources, diet and also host. You know, the non-digestible and undigested dietary components that have escaped our digestion and absorption will inevitably be used by some kind of bacteria. So this is one source of nutrients for sustaining our gut microbiota. The other source is from the host, from the mucins we secrete, or from the left cells of the colon, and also some other secretions, and uh, like bioacids. So the, it's a combination of diet and host-derived nutrients which are sustaining the gut microbiota community. Uh, we know that the human body is already very complex. Adding to that complexity, now you have a microbiome, which is also very complex. So how can we tackle this super complexity? And in addition to this very complex system, we also need to ask the causality question. So there are so many evidences published that diseased people have a different gut microbiota or other parts of the microbiota from healthy people. But we, the, the microbiota changed because of the disease or the disease happened because of the microbiota change. Chicken or egg, this is always a very fundamental question when you study gut microbiota in health and disease. So we argue that even though it's a complex microbial ecosystem, we still to need to follow Cocker's postulates for identifying the causative agent of a particular infectious disease. But we need to consider the polymicrobial and ecological nature of gut microbiota. So first, we need to do microbiome-wide association study. We should identify all the members which are positively or negatively associated with the disease or with a particular health phenotype. And then we should isolate the, the, those uh, associated members either into pure culture or into defined consortium. And then we should put this into a germ-free animal background and see if we can give the right environmental condition, see if we can reproduce the phenotype. If we can, then we should understand the molecular mechanism. So only after we complete all these cycles of research, maybe we can claim that gut microbiota plays a causative role and which members can be used as both biomarkers and also as drug targets. But before we do that, we should realize that strings are the functional units and the living units, functional units of, of uh, bacteria. Because by definition, strings within the same named bacterial species can share up to 30% of genomic difference. We know that the human and the mice only share 10% of genomic sequence difference. So that's why we need to go down to string level to understand the causality and the ecology. So how can we tackle this complex uh, complexity? If you look at my uh, postal address, it's exactly the same information, but uh, written in English and Chinese. In Chinese, you start with the country, the city, the university, the building, the room, the family, and then the person. It's top down. But in English, it's the opposite. You start with the person, the family, the room, all the way up to the country. So English-speaking people are bottom-up people. Chinese people are top-down people. Well, it's not just the language, the culture. The, the way we, we do science is also the different. So this top-down thinking and bottom-up thinking, if you look at this, all the parts, you, you can understand all the parts of an engine, but you still do not know how the engine works and whether the engine is, has any problem or not. But when you put all the parts together, you have some new functions emerge. It's so-called so emergent functions, like noise, exhaust gas, and vibration. So to understand the whole, one must study the whole. You should look at the emergent functions, try to understand the complex system. And uh, so in Chinese, uh, the medical doctors, traditional medical doctors, they do exactly the uh, top-down approach. 
So they never divide the human, human body into different parts, but they measure uh, emergent functions at whole body level. Like look at your tongue, the touch your pulse, and then they have their own principles to do pattern recognition and diagnosis. And then they give you a decoction, they give you acupuncture, they, they ask you to change your diet, they do everything they can, and then they read the changes of the whole body level emergent functions and to, 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 to decide what to do next, and eventually you know, to help you recover your health. But we know this is all empirical. But in, in modern day engineering, you can, do, you can mount thousands of sensors to a running engine, and uh, you can do online monitoring of the health and uh, problem diagnostics of your running engine by focusing on vibration, noise, and exhaust gas. But can we do this to human body? Yeah. And uh, if you look at uh, u urine, fecal matter, and blood, these are the three windows only a live person can have. But so these are the emergent functions. But they contain all kinds of biological information, which can be profiled and quantified and analyzed, uh, captured by using all kinds of omics technology. So if you do molecular profiling of molecular level variations of these three windows over time of a cohort of people, uh, either natural progression or uh, disease development or in responding to any type of uh, uh, treatment or intervention, and then you may be able to identify patterns, signatures in these three windows which are associated with a particular phenotype you are interested in at the whole body level. So how can we do that? One way is to correlate changes of gut microbiota with some metabolites. Uh, in their environment. So this is a proof of principle study we did with Professor Jeremy Nicholson from uh, uh, Imperial College and also several other groups in China. So we collected a urine and a fecal sample over a monthly interval from a seven member of four generation Chinese family. And then we analyzed the microbiome variations intra-individually and inter-individually uh, we also analyzed uh, uh, metabolites uh, by using NMR-based metabolomics in the urine samples. And then we do OPSDA modeling to do two-way correlation analysis between these two data metrics. So in this proof of principle study, we identified 10 members of the gut microbiota, each showed association with at least one urine metabolite. This particular member, Fecalibacterium prosonitae, showed eight associations, six uh, positive and two negative. So this is the indication that if you were a postdoc, you would like, I would ask you to pick a bacterium to study. You may want to study this one because this may have the widest uh, impact directly or inter indirectly to human metabolism. So this was highlighted when it was published uh, in uh, early 2008. It was highlighted by Nature Reviews Microbiology as a platform technology for finding out who does what in the microbiome. And yesterday, Dr. Nielsen gave a beautiful example of using this approach to identify potentially some key bacteria impacting human insulin. Uh, so I would like to, with all these concepts and methodology, I would like to focus on uh, obesity, and uh, type 2 diabetes uh, to give you two examples in, uh, uh, for, for understanding the community ecology. Um, we know that from many publications from per Professor Jeff Gordon's group and many other groups, uh, gut bacteria may play a cause, uh, positive, uh, very important role in development of metabolic diseases, obesity or type 2 diabetes. But we still need to identify the key members which are causatively contributing to the disease or to recover of disease. The approach we use is to change the diet of a diseased group of people and see if we can change the phenotype. And over time, we collect urine, blood, and fecal samples at different time points, before, during, and after. And then we do molecular profiling of changes in these three windows 
and correlation analysis. See if we can identify any potentially important members of the gut microbiota which are uh, potentially contributing to the, to the disease or to recovery of health. How can you change the, the gut microbiota to a healthier structure? Well, we, we, we learn from uh, traditional Chinese medicine because Chinese medicine has a very long tradition using food as medicine or medicine as food. So in China, you have an officially published list of plants by Ministry of Health of China. And plants in that list can be used as common food by everybody. But they also have been used as medicine by Chinese doctors for thousands of years. So after more than a decade of study on these plants, we realized that there are two kinds of ingredients which are very important in those plants. One kind of are non-digestible but fermentable carbohydrates, mainly various plant polysaccharides. And the other are various groups of phytochemicals. So they can be used as nutrients of beneficial bacteria, and they can also work as protectants for beneficial bacteria. So we, we developed about seven or eight years ago, we developed a dietary scheme uh, which can take, uh, satisfy the, uh, provide a balanced nutrition to human, but also provide uh, enough nutrients for the microbiome. So this was featured in, uh, in this uh, article, new uh, science of, uh, news article. So if you are interested, you could uh, uh, read that. I give you this uh, case study, so N equals one clinical trial. So we focus on this young man, uh, near 175 kilograms, BI, BMI nearly 60, and he was on this dietary program for 23 weeks, and he lost more than 50 kilograms without exercise. So just this diet for about six months, and he lost more than 50 kilograms. And he recovered from type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He was almost hyper everything before. But then he recovered after 23 weeks and losing 51.4 uh, kilograms. And he also had a reduced inflammation and a reduced lipopolysaccharide binding protein, indicating that Toxin, endotoxin, which can induce inflammation produced by gram negative opportunistic uh, pathogens, uh, are, are decreasing in their uh, load. And uh, so we did a very simple PCR DGGE fingerprinting and, uh, over time. So you, you see three bands representing three major populations at the baseline disappeared very quickly and they remained almost undetectable throughout the, the clinical trial. We cut out the DNA and identified the DNA, sequenced them, and identified as members of Enterobacter genus. And this genus contained 10 species. They all can induce sepsis. So they are opportuni uh, opportunistic pathogens, gram-negative, can induce inflammation. And we also did metagenomic sequencing at the baseline uh, nine week and 23 week uh, after. Uh, and we found uh, genes involved in, genes involved in uh, synthesis of uh, uh, lipopolysaccharide. Uh, quite a few of them reduced their uh, uh, abundance. So then we did, uh, we isolated uh, several hundred uh, uh, putative colonies of Enterobacter uh, genus, and we run co-migration against the baseline DNA fingerprinting. So any colony which can I, I migrate to identical position to at least one of these bands will be kept and characterized. So eventually we got uh, strings, a predominant string, Enterobacter cloacae B29. So we, we focus on, on this uh, particular pathogen. And then we inoculate this pathogen into germ-free mice and gave germ-free mice either high-fat diet or normal true diet. Professor Jeff Gordon's group and many other groups already showed that germ-free mice cannot become obese, even if you give them high-fat diet. But after you colonize with a whole gut, a, a, a normal microbiota, and then they can become obese, obese and insulin resistant. And when, when, you, when we give this single pathogen isolated from this uh, obese uh, uh, donor, it can also become obese. And it can 
develop a lot of uh, visual fat and uh, insulin resistance, fatty liver, inflammation, and uh, Professor Jeff Gordon's group identified uh, a gene in the gut which is necessary, the expression of this gene is necessary for burning stored fat, but it was shut down by whole gut microbiota and only can induce by hunger. But if, you, if the gut microbiota was uh, dysbiotic and this gene was turned off, turned off very tightly, and you can, even if you feel hunger, you cannot turn this gene, this gene on, you cannot burn st uh, stored fat. And they also found that the whole gut microbiota actually can upregulate genes in the liver for transforming glucose into, uh, into new fat, uh, ACC1 fats and the PIPA gamma. So all, this, all these two groups of genes uh, regulated by the gut microbiota as identified by Professor Jeff Gordon's group can be uh, uh, you know, regulated by the single pathogen. This is probably why, because the colonization of this pathogen in the gut prevents the host from burning salt fat, but encourage the host synthesizing new fat from glucose. So that's why they can accumulate such excessive amount of fat in the same time period. Uh, so this is an example. This was published in 2012. And uh, in the past five years, we have been working with Professor uh, Philip Gerhard tried to identify the molecular mechanism. So we already, we, 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 we did a mutation in a LPS synthetic pathway and removed most of the pro-inflammatory activity of the LPS and then the mutant lost all the capacity for inducing obesity, fat liver and everything. So there's no, no obesity related uh, de development if you mutate LPS. We also did, we mutated the TOLAC receptor 4 and derived the germ-free mice. If you give wild type, no obesity. So only, if, only when you have uh, LPS endotoxin and TOLAC receptor 4 intact and uh, cross talk with each other induce inflammation, you have all the phenotypes downstream. So the molecular interaction between uh, the, gut, uh, the, 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 the LPS and uh, also TOLAC receptor 4 may be the first molecular event leading to all the downstream phenotypes. Uh, so this is an N equals 1 study. We only focus on one single case. But we also did a clinical trial with a, a genetic form of childhood obesity. It's called the Prader-Willi syndrome, PWS. Children with this disease, they had a defect region in the number 15 chromosome from the father's side. They were born with very low muscle tone couldn't even suck enough milk. So they were very small and undernourished before weaning. But after weaning, when they start to take solid food, they quickly develop a hyperphagia. They are hungry all the time, and they cannot, uh, uh, you cannot satisfy them with any amount of food. And uh, uh, it's very difficult to control their body weight growth. However, when we work with uh, Guangdong Women and the Children's Hospital, to, to do clinical trial with uh, mobile obese children, we accidentally found that one third of the children in our program, they were actually PWS patients. They were genetically obese, but they responded very well to the dietary intervention of their gut, gut microbiota. Like this particular boy, 14 years old, 140 kilograms heavy, and he stayed on the program in a hospital for 285 days, reduced to 83.6 kilograms. He continued the intervention at home. After 430 days, he was 73 kilograms. So he lost about half of his body weight only on diet, no exercise, and recovered from all the metabolic problems. And uh, so we eventually we recruited. That he also didn't get any taller, even though he was only 14. It, it's a genetic problem. They don't grow much. It's a, didn't help that. Only helped with. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, also reduce the density. No, he, he's, he's, uh, this type of uh, uh, children, they don't grow much. By the age of 14, they already mature. So they don't have the potential to grow that much. But uh, uh, so they, we recruited 17 children with PWS, 
and they stayed in the hospital for three months. And then uh, same obese, mobile obese children without genetic reason, simple obese children stayed in the hospital for one month. So at the baseline, at the end of each month, uh, thorough medical checkup for medical phenotypes and also collection of urine, blood, and fecal samples. For one month in the program, they lost about 10% of the initial body weight, and uh, three, mo three months lost about 20%. And they recover from, from uh, uh, so they have improved glucose homeostasis, lipid profile, and liver function. And they also have uh, significantly elevated inflammation. And then lipopolysaccharide binding protein also significantly reduced. And then we transplanted the uh, baseline microbiota and three months after microbiota from the same person to germ-free mice. The baseline microbiota can induce inflammation in the first weeks. And then after that, the, 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 uh, they start to uh, accumulate more fat. So the baseline microbiota can induce inflammation and can encourage uh, uh, more excessive accumulation of fat. But the after-intervention microbiota do not have that capacity. So this is the indication that even, gut, even diet itself can improve directly host health but uh, it also changes the microbiota, and the change of the microbiota may have also partially contributed to their metabolic health improvement. We then did a, a metabolomics analysis of the fecal water sample, and they showed a significant shift before and after the intervention. And mainly, you see a lot of carbohydrates increase in the fecal water, and many bacterial metabolites decreased. And then we uh, analyzed the short-chain fatty acids, uh, they are the products from fermenting protein or fermenting uh, carbohydrates. So we see a relative increase of acetate, but relative decrease of isobutyrate and isovalerate. This is the indication that after we change the diet, bacteria shifted from fermenting protein to get energy to fermenting carbohydrates to get energy. And the side products are changing from detrimental and becoming uh, beneficial. And now we would like to understand the string level changes of the gut community. Uh, so we did a metagenomic sequencing of all the samples, inter-individual samples and the intra-individual samples. Because we dramatically changed the diet, so we induced a lot of uh, changes, variations of the, of the uh, members of the gut microbiota. And uh, so we would like to see uh, the detailed uh, structural changes. And then we used the canopy-based algorithm introduced by uh, Professor uh, Dr. Nielsen and, uh, yesterday. So we, can, we identified a little bit over 2 million uh, non-redundant microbial genes. And after co-abundance uh, analysis, we get 20,000 uh, co-abundance gene groups. And 376 uh, of these uh, gene groups contain more than 700 genes, so they are each uh, is uh, uh, potentially a bacterial genome. 161 of these are shared by more than 20% of the samples. So they are, they are potentially the uh, chromosomes of uh, prevalent genomes. And then we did uh, uh, assembly of the genome based on each CAG, and we get 118 high quality drafted genomes. So they meet at least five of the six criteria for the American Human Microbiome Project reference genomes. So they, their quality is almost as high as when you do pure cultural sequencing. So now we would like to, to see the co-abundance co uh, relationship between these genomes to understand their ecological relationship. So uh, out of 161 co-abundant gene groups, genomes, uh, we can delete them into 18 potentially guilds. Each colored group is a potentially a guild because they increase or decrease together. But if they are connected with red line, they co-occur. If they are connected with the blue line, they co-exclude. Our dietary scheme significantly promoted this group of bacteria. They increased their abundance dramatically after the new diet. And the three members of this group are from Bifidobacterium genus. And particularly Bifidobacterium pseudocantinolatum this particular species had the highest number of negative correlation with the members of many other guilds. And those negatively associated are potentially pathogens, 
or producing some detrimental compounds uh, by looking at their uh, genome. And so we hypothesized that our dietary scheme probably promoted this group of bacteria as a foundation species. And when they grow to a high abundance level, they produce a lot of things, like they acidify the gut, and they also produce many antimicrobials, so that the gut environment becomes favorable to beneficial bacteria, but unfavorable to many detrimental bacteria. So this actually restructured the whole gut microbiota. If we do guild level abundance analysis, you start to see correlation of uh, different guild with individual human phenotypes. So three guilds showed a negative correlation with disease phenotypes, and nine guilds showed a positive correlation with disease phenotypes. And the six guilds didn't respond to this uh, dietary intervention. So now the, the major, uh, all these uh, uh, 161 high quality draft genomes, they can, they amount to more than half of the total sequence we get. So that means they are prevalent and also dominant uh, uh, members of the gut ecosystem. So now they are organized into this skilled ecological structure. And blue arrowed ones are potentially beneficial, and the red arrowed ones are potentially detrimental, and the others may be neutral. Uh, so I would like to comment that the, the currently Many data analysis in the microbiome field is the so-called taxon-based analysis. So you do uh, genus level, family level, all the way up to phylum level analysis between disease and health. Or, uh, but this is a problem. Why? Because bacteria, they form functional group. They work together not based on their taxonomy. So if you look at the members of the guild, some guild, they have members from four different phyla. Some have members from one phylum. So they work together based on the function, not based on their taxonomy. So if you do taxon, taxon based analysis, you introduce a lot of noise. And also, the, the, even in the same species, like in Fecalibacterium prosnitae, we assembled nine genomes, but they are in four different uh, uh, guilds. So that means members of the same species, they don't uh, behave the same. And uh, so we need to go down to string level. Uh, we look at this, uh, the, the, this particular boy. In the first 105 days, we had multiple time points uh, sampling. If you look at the genus level, you see a lot of variations. But there is a steady increase of bifidal genus. But if you look at the species level, nine species identified, but only pseudocannulatum actually showed a substantial increase. And then we isolated five strings from this species, from one single sample from this person, and five strings. And we did the finished sequencing. You can see the five strings, they share uh, 1,520 genes in their core genome. And they don't have much difference uh, gene number-wise. Uh, however, during the first 105 and five days, they showed a different response to the same dietary intervention. So this is a really a string level uh, uh, function. And uh, one of the string can actually be used as probiotics to alleviate high fat diet induced obesity in mice. And uh, how, my, uh, how much time I have? Okay, so I would uh, probably just quickly go over the, uh, so we also analyzed uh, the urine metabolites and we also found a significant shift before and after. And then we identified uh, the significantly changed the metabolites. So 14 metabolites significantly changed. Uh, uh, so five of them actually promoted, and the others reduced. Uh, among the nine reduced metabolites by the dietary intervention, four actually are co-metabolites by the host and also by the gut bacteria. So what, what happened was the gut bacteria ferments a lipid or ferment a protein into potentially toxic uh, metabolites. And then this will get into the liver, and the host liver will further modify this and uh, adding sulfate or uh, other uh, 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 groups, and they become water-soluble, and they're coming out of the urine. And TMAO 
has been known to induce atherosclerosis uh, and significantly reduced. But we don't know which bacteria actually convert choline in the diet to TMA, and then TMA gets into the liver and become oxidized into TMAO, and then TMAO can promote atherosclerosis. So we don't know which bacteria are potentially doing this uh, conversion from choline, dietary choline to TMA. And then if you do, uh, if you take the 161 or 118 high quality draft genome, and this 13 metabolites changed, you do, you do correlation, you found among 118 uh, high quality draft genomes, 31 show the positive correlation with the urine concentration of TMAO. Among these, 13 actually have the two genes uh, required for converting choline into TMA. So these 13 bacterial genomes are potentially the, the potential key bacteria for uh, promoting or contributing to uh, atherosclerosis. And uh, we are now isolating the bacteria and try to demonstrate the mechanism in germ-free mice uh, so it looks like that when you change the available nutrients to the gut microbiota, so you change the, the, the resource, and there is a guild level response. So it's not a random uh, individual response. You, you see a guild level response to the resource change. And you can actually dissect and establish that structure. Uh, and the most important thing is uh, the foundation guild and also guilt which are potentially beneficial or potentially detrimental. It's possible to identify them and uh, for uh, forming new hypotheses and to do further molecular study. Uh, so I would like to finish by emphasizing that foundation species is different from keystone species. So keystone species is this piece of stone, which is not necessarily the major member but it's very critical for holding the whole structure. But the foundation stone is the piece of stone underneath the whole structure. So I think the, the potential species we identified, they are not important for one particular guild. They are actually important for holding the whole uh, healthy uh, structure. Um, so the, I think the most important uh, impact of microbiome study to human health is that we have a new window to assess and monitor human health. Anything you do to human body, to each, either to a particular individual or to a large number of people, you can just assess the response of the host by looking at how the gut microbiota respond and how their metabolites and also other antigens which can interact with the host also change. And, also, and connect that with eventual organism level phenotype changes of the host. So this is the most uh, important way, uh, a, new, uh, a new, new methodology for assessing and monitoring human health. And so this can be you know, uh, applied to a large scale of, uh, of uh, people and also can be used to understand either a complex uh, intervention like Chinese medicine or a complex intervention like a new diet. Uh, you can understand the molecular level response. Uh, so I would like to finish with this uh, uh, theoretical model. Genetically, we may live up to 150 years. That's our genetic potential. And uh, so if you analyze uh, molecular level changes uh, in urine, blood, and fecal, and also other medical phenotypes, and then you use all the data to quantify the health at any given time point. And if you do that throughout the lifespan, you may get a trajectory like this. So this is the ideal trajectory. You live healthy throughout your 150 years, and you die in the last week. Right? <laughs> and, uh, but the unfortunate individuals born with genetic defect and die prematurely. But most people, have a trajectory like this. Roughly 50 years old is a you know, uh, turning point. Before that, we are okay. After that, we are going down the hill and eventually end up in a hospital with one or several you know, chronic disease. And uh, modern day technology can keep a person alive for many years, even though you know, he, he was paralyzed. 
But if this decline of health after middle age was due to our genetic defect, we still don't know what we can do. But if a genetic defect only increase the risk, but the actual manifestation of the disease requires environmental triggers, and the toxins produced by gut bacteria may be the most important triggers, and then we have hope, because we know the gut microbial community is uh, plastic, and we can change the, the community back to a healthy status and monitor that, make sure that you remain in this region until the last day. So, eat right, keep fit, live long, die quick. Okay. <laughs>